Well, then, you are not hopeful about integration in the southern United States, even if it comes. Am I right? That is not quite what I mean. Um, let me put it another way, all right? Um, in the first place, it is not a southern problem. It is a national problem. What is happening in New Orleans today began to happen over a hundred years ago when, in effect, the North, which was the government, having freed tens of thousands of illiterate black men, they made no provision for them, none whatever. None whatever. They were dumped on the body politic, and no one was responsible for them. And they were, of course, immediately political and, and industrial footballs for everybody. They were everybody's target. Because, after all, they had to go to school. Now, the, they got to go to school after Booker T. Washington in 1895, who was the architect, really, of the separate but equal principle, said, in effect, said exactly that uh, education will not make us different Education will not, make us, will not give us any desire to become equal to you. That in all things um, social, we can be as separate as the fingers, and all things essential and mutual progress, we can be as one as the hand. Now, this idea was accepted by the nation, not only by the South. But the South refused to provide the Negroes with the kind of educational facilities that the North more or less made available to them. No, no this is not true either. I'm afraid that is not the way it happened. That is not the way it happened. What happened, the Negro education began, and really began in the South, and is still very largely located there. There are Negro universities in the South. There are very few Negro universities in the North, because the North is technically not segregated. But it is very difficult, on the other hand, you know, to enter. I don't mean it's difficult because the law is against it, or any of these things. I mean that it's a complex of things. You grow up, I grew up in Harlem. So naturally, I went to Harlem schools. Had to go to Harlem schools. There were the only schools, you know, in my neighborhood. You know? Yeah. Um, you grow up, if you're an American Negro, no matter where you live in the country, you are living in a segregated community. The South has, you know, all those things we know about in the South, and in every great northern city has its ghetto. And I know how difficult it is to get out of these ghettos because I was born in one. Well, James, are you suggesting then that, uh, in effect, officially, in the South, there is inequality and no freedom for the Negro. And unofficially, but just as effectively, there is no freedom for the Negro in the North. The terms are different, but the reality is the same. A boy in Birmingham um, is in great trouble in Birmingham. He has, in a way, one advantage, though. It's very clear in Birmingham that he can't go anywhere. A boy born in New York can go almost anywhere. Almost. Almost. This can drive you mad. This can drive you mad. You can live almost anywhere if you fight to get in. You can enter almost any nightclub. You can enter almost any bar, and nothing will happen. But this almost means that there is a bar, there is a hotel, there is a doorman, there is an elevator boy, there is somebody every day. There is that one place you cannot go, which means you enter every door on edge. Now, this is not true in the South. When a, when a Negro boy goes in the Woolworths in the South and sits down, he knows very well what he's up against. He knows that they want him there, and, he's, and the only way that he can stay there is to say, in effect, what they have said, you know. We not only are entitled to service, but we want it. Yes, but there's more and more of this going on in the South. Negro boys are going into Woolworths, they're going on buses, not only Negro boys, Negro girls. And they're insisting on their right to sit anywhere in a bus or sit, and they're insisting on their right to sit down at the counter. They're refusing to sit in uh, colored waiting rooms only, and bus depots and things like that. They are insisting on a change in this condition. They are indeed. No, but and, they, I'm sorry. Well, doesn't this suggest a change and, and uh, progress in the relations and in the status of the Negro in these areas? It may or may not, may not mean that, but what it does mean, this is why the South is so panic-stricken, and essentially the country is so panic-stricken about it, it means this. The generation of boys and girls who are sitting down at those lunch counters 
are the first generation of Negroes in the entire history of America who were not controlled by the American's image of them. This is why Montgomery is so demoralized, Little Rock is so paralyzed, New Orleans, people are going mad. If you have, I was in Montgomery after the bus boycott, after, the, after, it, after it had succeeded, which outlawed segregation on the buses. Now, Montgomery is really, after all, a rather small southern town. If you can find anywhere in the deep south Negroes, the south has been saying for generations, they know. They know the Negro. You would find them in that town. There was not a Negro in that town, really, essentially, who was not working with some white man. There was really no middle class. There were no outside agitators. These people walked. These people terrified. The, t the town is still terrified because they don't, not, ter you know, not even on the obvious level about violence. If they're not who I thought they were, who are they? Well, who did the whites, South, Southern, and Northern, uh, Northern think the Negroes were? What is this image that you were talking about? This is precisely about? what it's so difficult to get down to, but let me, put it, let me try to put it this way. Um, what do you see? I don't, know, I don't know what white people see you know, when they look at a Negro anymore, but I do know very well. Um, that I realized when I was very young that whatever, whatever he was looking at, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Um, it was something he was afraid of. It was something um, to which he was attracted or which he found repulsive, but it wasn't me. I was not a man. Now, this image, I don't know what this image is, but it has something to do. It has something to do, I'm convinced of this, with the Puritan God. It has something to do with a peculiar and, I believe, absolutely bankrupt morality under which we are all are suffering. The one person who was outside this constriction, in fact, and historically, and in life, was this pagan, this black pagan. Who was brought over who was as brought over, chattel. that's right, who was brought over as a chattel uh, to, a, to, to God's country. Now, somewhere, I think in order to deal with it all, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning and try to imagine, I don't know how, I, I don't know if this can be done, but I think we've got to try, uh, what it must have been like then. Because then, after all, he really was a pagan. He had nothing to do not only with the, stand, you know, the Puritan, Puritanical standards of America, but with the European tradition out of which Americans came. He really was a stranger. He really, he really did frighten them. He didn't, they did not know what to do with him. And they still don't. And in a way, the, the sexual legends which have sprung up around the figure of, of the Negro in, a, in America contain somehow the key, the truth, about our situation. It is still true. That the, that, the, that the question which ends the argument, stops the argument, is would you let your sister marry one? It is still a question to which, in effect, the country has found no answer. Do you think that there is this pretense? The, the, the thing that impresses me while I try to understand the problem of the relationship of white and Negro in the United States, which seems to me a very crucial problem indeed, is the earnest desire of what I can only call Christian thinking uh, Americans to remedy this, this terrible, enduring wrong, to find some way to make expiation, to find some way to give the Negro equality as a citizen of that country. Surely this is the real significance, for example, behind this whole struggle for integration. I quite agree with that. I quite agree with that. But in order for this to be achieved, there is one thing which has to be done which is not being done. And that is this. It is not. It is not a question of giving the Negro equality. That is not really the question. The question is why you haven't. Why you haven't? Yes. Why, why doesn't he have it yet? This question is important. This question implies... How can I put this? that in order to deal with it, really deal with it, you have to first to deal with yourself. I know a great many very well-meaning, 
and very admirable people who work, let us say, in settlement houses, all up and down, you know. Now, with very rare exceptions, they do not really make contact with the people they are trying to help precisely because they think they are trying to help them. And the problem is more crucial and more subtle than that. A Negro boy dealing with a white school teacher doesn't want to be helped that way. He wants to be accepted. He has to be accepted as a boy, as a person. As a human any, being. That's right. Before anything can be done with him. He cannot be handled as a problem. It's not a question of giving you Negro equality. It's a question of making the country grow up. Do Does that I, make sense to you? Yeah. But do I draw the conclusion from this fairly, that what you're saying is that in some peculiar way, there is a need on the part of the American to feel, the white American, to feel that the Negro American is a dependent that there is a need to put the American Negro in a place apart? Mm-hmm. That is one of the things I mean. I also mean, and I also mean to imply something else. Um, let me put it personally. It's the safest way to put it. Um, there is something in me, for example, you know, sometimes, and certainly when I was much younger, which resented the assumption on which all these things are based. It assumes that you have something I want. It somehow assumes that I have not been to your wedding and haven't made my own judgments about the marriage. What makes you think, after all, I always, I've often felt like saying, that I want to get into the white man's world. Look at it. But you Look are part of that world. Oh, of course. Everyone is. There's no way I... No. But, but I'm trying to point out this. That um, there, is, there really isn't on the basis of it. Just looking at the evidence. Any reason for white people to assume the Negroes want to be like them? In fact, on the basis of the evidence, one will conclude that anybody in his right mind would do his best not to become like well, that. Well, the situation has changed in this respect, surely. That whereas before, uh, your American Negro depended on the NCAAP. NAACP. I'm sorry, NAACP, um, to conduct legal battles for him on a very small level. And that's, a, no, that's no. much more complex than that. Well, if I may just finish this point. Oh. Whereas before he depended upon that kind of organization, or he accepted the Booker T. Washington proposition, give me equal but separate facilities and I will be happy today, he will not accept. Cannot. Cannot accept that. Cannot. Now isn't this a qualitative change in the entire situation? Yes, but you must remember what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, trying, to, what I'm trying to convey. Because I'm not arguing that the situation has changed. I'm not even arguing you know, that the progress has been made. I'm not questioning the goodwill you know, of the people who are doing it mm -hmm. or helping to do it. It's not the question. What I'm trying to get at is this. All right, all right, all right, that's true. But you, oneself, 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 the boy, the girl, no is in fact living in a house that he can't move out of because he's black. But there is surely an end to these uh, wretched and miserable and degrading stereotypes uh, that I was brought up on as a white person, and all of us were brought up on who are white. The, the Stephen Fetchets, the Bojangles Robinsons, the Aunt Jemimas, all these the Octavius Roy Cohn stories and all the rest this of is all in, this is gone. This is incontestable. But what has come to take its place is not truer. It is still an image which is still designed not to reveal the truth, but to hide it. A Belafonte, a James Baldwin, a Ralph Ellison, well, a Lorraine Hansberry are not closer to revealing the truth? Well, now, Ralph and Lorraine and myself are not performers. All right, let's drop Belafonte. Let's move into the world of letters. All right, all right. But before we drop Belafonte, let me say this. Harry, you know, is also, I think, you know, a, a very, uh, obviously, you know, one of the most talented people around. And um, knows exactly what he's doing, and he's great, he, and he is very important. He's, he's even very important from the, from the point of view of morale building among Negro kids. He's very important. And yet, and yet, Harry, I have a feeling, must work within, 
the psychological, emotional framework of the country. Now, you cannot be Belafonte and not know, after all, why people come to see you, you, know, and, you and not know, you know what it really is that's happening between you and your audience. But if we examine, and I think later on we should do that, try to, what is really happening, I think we will find that, um, again, the image has not changed. In some way, um, it, it is not that Belafonte is, it is not so much that this particular man is being accepted, though this is true, but what is really crucial is that something else, and something in the white world, I mean, has failed. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I follow that. All right, then how about our, how about our writers? Ralph, Lorraine, I. What one's trying to do, and um, the reason Lorraine's play is really important, the reason, you know, that Invisible Man is such an important achievement, is because it is the first time, almost the first time, I think probably the very first time, that a Negro has managed to achieve, t to step out of the image, um, out of the cage. Out of the cage, really. Now, let's compare this. This is um, arbitrary. I don't mean to be unjust, but I think that we can do it this way. I admire, I admire you know, the late Richard Wright very much. But there, at the heart of Native Son, which is a very important novel, the, the central figure, Bigger Thomas, is really a white man's idea of a Negro. Now, because after, after all, what does happen is that the Negro takes the image which he's offered and believes it himself. You know. Mm -hmm. um, now, what Ralph did in Invisible Man was very, very different. It was very, very different. And superficially, perhaps, you know, the, uh, the novels may seem to have a great deal in common, but the great break between them is that Ralph dealt with his people and this boy from the inside and was no longer being described in any way whatever, really, by other people, but was imposing his definition of himself on the world. For years, for years and for years, for, well, for all the time we know about, really, all the time that matters to us, Negroes, black men, have been described by white people. Um, in order for the Negro slave to become uh, an American, he had to accept all the definitions which were offered him, the language, the psychology, the theology, the morals, everything. He was defining himself in terms of someone else's definition. It is very important when the day comes, and instead of being defined by others, you do, are able to define yourself and the threat, which is what, always what is felt, by the people who have been describing you, is that if you can describe yourself, then you can describe them. And if you can describe them, what would you say? And in the case of the American Negro describing uh, white people, one can see, I think, how great the panic might be. Why? Well, what would I have to say about... Um, American liberalism. Yes, what would I really have to say about... Um, if I were going to describe... I can't name names, so... A hypothetical white liberal. Well, I know what he thinks he's doing. But what he's mainly doing is something which demands my tacit cooperation. He, I have to agree that I am what he says I am in order for us to have any dialogue at all. Now, if I don't agree that uh, he is what he what 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 he what he's you know, what I, I, I am what he thinks I am. Then inevitably, and I, you know, one sees this at once in the face of the people you're, you're, you're dealing with, it means that if I'm not what he takes me to be, that means I have, a, I have a standard of judgment which is not his, which I may then be using to judge him. And which may cut the ground from under, under all the standards. All the other, yeah, exactly. Do you regard this as a, as a distinct threat to the, what shall I call it, the, uh, the sense of spiritual security in America? I think American, I think the American essentially, I don't think this, I know this. Yes, this is a threat to the American personality as it has so far been constituted. It's a threat to every, it is a threat to their definition of the world. It is, a, it is a threat to, their, to the way they, what they think reality is. For example, 
This may seem extremely far-fetched. But let's think about this for a minute. It has very often seemed to me that the American notion of the world, which makes it so simple, things are black or white, things are good or bad, people are straight or crooked, and life is not like that. I mean, anybody who begins to grow up knows that life is not like this at all. It seems to me that it's a reflection, a direct reflection, of the effort made by the white American to keep away from to not be threatened by black people. In some way, the, the, the American vision of the world is all wrapped up with their vision of black men, which has to do, their, has to do with their vision of themselves. Black is evil. The saved are white. Now, there is certainly a thread which connects this reality to, uh, which it may, makes, and makes it possible for uh, the Secretary of State to say, we will not do business with the devil. You see what I mean? This no, I'm not. I, 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 you I don't follow I this. Follow part of Let me try to do it. it Let me try to do it again. Um, I was saying before that in a way, black men were very useful to the American because in a country so absolutely undefined, so amorphous, where there were no limits, no height really, and, and no depth, there was one thing of which one could be certain. One knew where one was by knowing where the Negro was. You knew that you were not on the bottom because the Negro was, because the Negro was there. You knew one knows what sin is in the same way. One knows what danger is in the same way. When I said this face is invested with all the vices and all the sanctities, you know, which um, people are afraid, that is one of the things I meant. Now, this implies a vision of oneself, it seems to me, and a vision of the world which doesn't stop at the American borders. It is also the way America deals with the world. And the world is much more complex than black or white. Let me ask you this question, then, Jim, because it seems to me we've been moving in the direction of it and then retreating at its implications. If such issues as the fight for desegregation and integration are mere manifestations of what is really a subterranean and basic conflict. How is this conflict going to be met? On what level is it going to be met? How is it going to be resolved? If all of these steps are mere incidental steps rather than essential ones. Now, all of these steps, um, I don't think any of these steps can be called incidental. Um, they're all essential. There are steps in this direction, though. What has to happen? I think Martin Luther King, in some mysterious way, has really hit, knows what it is. What he has done, it seems to me, for the first time, is to make that problem, the Negro problem, a matter of moral self-examination. He has made it more difficult than it was before to evade it by good works. The internal revolution that he has begun in must, cannot possibly avoid moving directly into the heart of the people who make up America. I mean, I, I mean that the problem will never be resolved until everybody in the country in some way, I know how impossible this sounds, however this is what has to happen is able, is somehow able, to do without this crutch. Because the other side of the difficulty, and this is very difficult, I have, I have said in effect that white men must give up what is in effect a crutch. That's right. So must I. This is entirely true. There is something very safe about being a Negro in a way because, ah, you can blame anything that happens to you on it. And this is the worst thing about being a Negro, quite apart now from New Orleans, race riots, lynchings, etc., etc. The worst thing about it is at one point, somewhere in yourself, you have to realize that, all right, you are a Negro, and this is all true, but before that, you are a man, and your life is in your hands. You are responsible for what happens to you. You cannot blame anybody for it. There is no point. There is no one to blame. You speak about this radical 
reconstitution of the entire social fabric of a country, of a re, of a, of a more than reorientation of a relationship between two peoples existing in this one country and must become one inevitably. It was suggested that the difficulties standing in the way of it are enormous, even though some important but not vastly significant progress has been made. Let me ask you a direct question. Under the circumstances in your heart, aren't you basically very pessimistic about the future for the Negro in the United States? No. No? No. I'm not a pessimist. Um, Pessimists, I've noticed, are silent. Um, I'm not bitter either, for example. People who are bitter are silent, too. Um, no, I'm not pessimistic. I don't know how this will be achieved, but it must be achieved. So we will have to do it. Why must it be achieved? Why cannot the situation simply continue in an easy, and perhaps bettering in some ways truce. It will not. It will not. It will not. It cannot. It cannot. The country is honeycombed with ghettos. People are starving and dying and growing bitter and, and turning into madmen and going into narcotics ward every day in those ghettos all over the country. That's in the north. And the south, the south is in a tremendous kind of storm. It, it is not possible for it to remain as it is. Is, is just not, no, not even a question. The pressures are too great. Hypothetically, if Birmingham, oh Lord, I shouldn't have mentioned Alabama, still, let us say Birmingham, if it should blow up tomorrow, it will not only be Birmingham, it won't only, the chain reaction won't spread from Birmingham to Atlanta to Nashville. It will spread from Birmingham to Nashville to Atlanta to New York to Detroit to Boston. It doesn't stop at the Mason-Dixon line. 